As we continue in our series, Finding Power for the Mission, we looked at Barnabas last week, and we'll look at him a little bit more this week as he makes his way to um, find Saul and Tarsus. And so we're going to, let's let's go ahead and let's read verses 25 through 27, just a couple of verses this morning, and then let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Acts chapter 11, verse 25. It says, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught, in a great many, uh, taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Excuse me, just verses 25 and 26. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this morning. And Lord, even when we face some technical difficulties and other challenges, Lord, we can always turn to your word. We can read it. And ultimately, Lord, it's we ask that your Holy Spirit does the teaching, does the convicting, does the, the goading on, Lord, and, and, and spurring us on in our walk with you as we look at your words, Father. Give us understanding. Open our hearts to understand more deeply, more clearly what you have for us, Lord. Father, work in our hearts, in each and every one of us, Father, myself included, as we look at this account, as we think of the many things that went, were undertaken in these few verses, in the attitude of these men, of these servants, Lord. Father, we can sometimes make the wrong conclusion that these men that have been recorded in, the, in your word, Lord, in Scripture, are somehow um, greater than men or almost like demi demigods, Lord. And that's just not true. They are sinful men who are your creation. And yes, they are men that you called out. They're men who were faithful and have been given to us as an example of their life and their service to you to encourage us to learn from the teachings that you have inspired them to write down Father, we know that your hand is upon them, but the grace that they received is the same grace that we receive today. And the salvation they received is the same salvation, Father. There is no other name under heaven by we are saved, but Jesus Christ. And it's the same name that they were saved by, the same person. And so, Father, let us remember to keep you as the center. Remember, you are the real hero, Father. You are the real author in all the pages of scripture. But we thank you for the example and the testimonies of these men. And I pray that we would glean from them and we would apply what needs to be applied to our lives and our service and our evangelism in everyday situations. Lord, help us not to lose heart or be discouraged in these areas. As we know, just like them, there were many who who rejected it, many who said no to you. Father, help us not to be focused on those things that have happened in the past or maybe a bad experience, Lord, but to be focused on the truth is, is that we know the answer. We know the answer. And it's Jesus Christ, Lord. There's no other way we can deal with our sin except for through Christ and Christ alone. And so we, we thank you again for your provision and ask that you would guide us through this time of study. In Jesus, holy and precious name I pray. Amen. And so, we're in Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> we have two results regarding Barnabas' arrival in Antioch. And one was that many were saved, as we saw in verse 24, the end. It says, and a great many people were added to the Lord. But also, in that increase in new believers meant that Barnabas needed help. And so many more were saved. Wiersbe says, when the saints, like Barnabas, are grounded in the word, they will have a strong witness to the lost. And there will be a balance in the church between edification and evangelism, worship and witness, teaching and testimony. And so with this increase of believers, Barnabas needed help. And therefore, Barnabas travels to Tarsus 
in search of Saul to enlist his help. And so Tarsus is a bit of a journey from where he is in Antioch. And so why Tarsus? Why travel that far? It's more or less 180 miles of, of a trip, or 288 kilometers. And of course, we have to estimate these based on how they would have traveled, um, obviously land, but also by sea. And so there was different routes he could have taken, but the historians believe it would have been a certain route. And so they figure about five and a half to six days of travel, about 180 plus miles, give or take. And so it was not a small journey. And if you recall, he made quite a journey already from Jerusalem to Antioch, which was something like 300 miles. And so this is no small feat. I mean, even today with modern transportation and a car to, you know, to then travel 300 miles and then another 180 miles, that's, that's a bit of a distance. Not, not to mention being doing it by foot or by sail. And so it's quite a ways to go. And so why? Well, the answer is Saul. That's why. And so why Saul? Why not Nicolaus? If you remember back in Acts chapter 6, we met a proselyte, which just means he was a, a, a Gentile who converted to Judaism, and then he became a believer. And he was one of the seven men that they had picked out to serve um, back in Acts chapter 6. And Nicolaus, we were told, is from Antioch. And so why not him? I mean, these men were all full of faith and of the Spirit, and they were serving faithfully. Um, might have, you know, this was certainly his old stomping ground, so he would have been familiar with the culture and the regions and the layout of the city. <coughs> and I believe the answer, if we turn back to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we look at verse 15. <clears throat> and this is where the Lord said to him, and this him is Ananias, not Ananias and Sapphira, and, but this is Ananias, the, the gentleman, that, um, this faithful servant that the Lord said to go to Saul after, he, um, after his, his conversion on the road to Damascus, and he was stationed somewhere and he was still uh, lacking his sight. And the Lord called Ananias to go. He said, go, for he is a chosen instrument. Paul, or at this time Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine, God says, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And so we know he is a chosen vessel of the Lord to go to the Gentiles. And we know that Paul always went to his fellow um, Israelites, to his fellow Jewish brethren with the gospel, and he would stand before kings. But his main ministry was to the Gentiles. And fast forward in chapter 9, if we go down to verses, um, well, we'll read from verse 26. <clears throat> it says, and when he had come to Jerusalem, this is Saul, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Now, why were they afraid of him? Because of all the persecution. If anything, they believe this was just some new tactic of his. Now he's going to come in, uh, set a trap, you know, yeah, I'm one of you, find out who all the believers are. Boom, spring the trap, get him arrested, throw him in prison, whatever. I mean, he's, he's done some pretty despicable things before this, so I'm sure they wouldn't put it past him. And so they were afraid of him. They didn't trust him. They didn't believe him. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And so Barnabas, we know, came alongside um, when no one else would, Saul. And we know that he was sent off to Tarsus for his own safety because they were seeking his life now, the Hellenists. Uh, this would probably be the, um, the same Hellenists, some of the same people that were the ones who stoned Stephen. That just means, in this case, this word Hellenist means they were Greek-speaking Jews. They were not um, Gentiles or, or believers. They were, they were Jewish men that did not like what Paul was, 
was pushing, what he was proclaiming, and which was the gospel. But, but praise the Lord, Barnabas recognized the boldness and the testimony, and God gave him discernment to see who Saul was now. He was no longer that old man. <clears throat> and so Barnabas was fully aware of Saul's conversion and his calling by the Lord to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Barnabas was also aware that Saul was sent back to Tarsus. So more, a little more on the godly characteristics of Barnabas is displayed. He didn't, you know, you know Barnabas being sent from, we could say the mother church there in Jerusalem, being sent to go as a representative of the, we could just say the, the flagship church at this time, to go and find out what's going on in Antioch with this, with the conversion of these, these um, Gentiles in Antioch. He could have went there and kind of threw his weight around a little bit, been like, you know, I'm here on official business. I'm here to find out what's going on. Um, he could have made it his own rather than, you know, made his own ministry, taken some kind of credit for it or anything like that. Could have just been like, this is a great opportunity. Look at all the seeds already been planted. There's a huge opportunity here for a big church or anything like that. He didn't. Instead, he rejoiced, remember, exceedingly with the, with the news of the believers. He, he encouraged them to remain faithful. And then God laid on his heart, reminded him of his time with Saul. We don't know how long that time was in Jerusalem, but he remembered the boldness, remembered the calling of Saul to the Gentiles. And instead of um, holding himself in high regard, he remembered the gifts of Saul. And he knew the calling. And so he went to Saul, as we just saw back in, uh, excuse me, as, as he was reminded back in Acts chapter 9 about, about the interaction with Saul. And so he thinks of Saul, he's humble. Um, you know, not everybody is going to have a ministry, going to be writing books, going to be traveling around as an evangelist or missionary. Uh, in fact, most of us won't. But we can all be encouraging. We can all be praying for these. We can all be recognizing the talents and gifts in others and being able to, instead of being jealous or instead of being, you know, like, oh, you know, I don't, why can't I have this position or, or, or whatever? We can recognize their gifts and their abilities that God's given to them and then recommend them, promote them, encourage them. Um, like Barnabas does here. Barnabas certainly was a good speaker. We, we, we do know this, it's, but um, it wasn't his calling. And so he recognized the gifts. He remembered what, the testimony about Saul. And then and so he thinks, this is where I need to go. This is for Saul. Um, I'm sure he was prayerful about this. I'm sure that he was giving this to the Lord and the Lord gave him um insight into this but we don't we don't have any information left in scripture like we do when peter went to the gentiles of a vision or anything like that it was just a godly discernment that god um, used barnabas in this position knowing that he would do the right thing that he would go find his brother and bring him to antioch and so you know it isn't always a matter of getting just getting some help it's a matter of getting the right help and additionally, it wasn't a matter of passing the buck, as they say. You know, Barnabas could have just um, saw what was going on in, in Antioch and went right back to Jerusalem, reported it, and moved on. Didn't, didn't, you know, didn't need to take more time. I mean, he already traveled 300 miles to travel back to another 300 miles. That's 600 miles round trip. He's probably tired. And not only that, we don't have any information as to when he was in Antioch that he was, you know, just walked into the city and boom, there they are. I'm sure there was a little bit of investigation to find out where the Christians are meeting and what and where this is taking place. It's not a small city after all. But instead he says, okay, I'm going to go get my brother. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, praise the Lord for what's going on here. Let me go get some help. And we're going to come back and work with you. And so then he travels to Tarsus, which I said is, a, you know, approximately 180 miles of journey. So He's going to be doing a lot of miles. Um, and so it was a matter of encouraging and participating in this work. That, that's what Barnabas is there to do. 
Um, there is a humility of being, of being exercised by Barnabas and a godly discernment. And so let's not gloss over that. Um, there was a sincere yielding to the will of God in this, in this area. We see this. This is more on the characteristics of Barnabas. And so let's continue. Let's read verse 25 again. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. I mentioned this last week, how when we're looking at scripture, you go from one verse to the next, or sometimes within one verse, you have a couple of lines and it covers a huge area. It's, it's just, we're getting these mountain peaks in, in the word of God. You know, he, he shows up, he exhorts them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And it says, for he was a, a good man, a characteristics of Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So we know he was evangelizing. And then it goes right to Saul. So, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. You know, like it just snap, snap, snap. Just goes, goes, goes. And it and it's it's these mountain peaks. But we have to understand there's travel involved. There's planning involved. And when we go back to the original text, we're going to learn some something more about Barnabas um, as he hunts for Saul. And so for... Um, and so several years have gone by, by the way, also since Saul fled to Jerusalem and went back to Tarsus. Um, some suggest at least 10 years have passed by since his conversion and flight back to Tarsus. So it's not a small time has passed either. Um, that's a number of years. And again, you know, we go from verse to verse, chapter to chapter, and it just flows. But we forget there is there is spaces of time within all, all of these events unfolding. And so this isn't just a matter of just looking up Saul on the yellow pages. I don't even know if we have yellow pages anymore. They certainly didn't have it back then um, and getting his contact information. Um, even if Barnabas could find out where Saul's home was or his local synagogue was, it was likely he was already disowned, kicked out of the local synagogue and so forth. And so it is without a doubt a difficult task to track down Saul. Now, I can also, we can say this quite emphatically because in the Greek, um, anazateo is the Greek word for to look for. And this word um, basically means it's to search diligently for someone. Um, some have described this word in the following. They said uh, anazateo suggests a laborious search. There's a Greek lexicographer, um, lexicographers, Moulton and Milligan, and they said anazateo is used uh, specifically of searching for human beings with an implication of great difficulty. And so it was not a simple search of just arriving in Tarsus, finding out where Saul is, and then tracking him down. He had to hunt for Saul. And so we don't, again, we don't know how long this took either. It took at least five and a half days for him to get there. Probably had to take a little rest, even if it was just for half a day, get some food, supplies, whatever, and, and started his search for Saul. We don't know how long that took. It could have taken a matter of days, but maybe it was weeks. I'm not sure. At the very least, from Barnabas going from Antioch to Tarsus and then returning back with Saul would have been at least a fortnight, right? At least two weeks, at the very least. And so there's some time involved here. And again, we know from the Greek language that it was a difficult search. It was one of great um, diligence. And so Saul is found. The work is going to begin, and then the disciples are first called Christians. So let's read verse 26 now. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many of people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Saul's found, and the two of them travel back to Antioch together. Now, some believe, based on Acts 22, verses 17 through 21, that Saul was already ministering to Jews and Gentiles when Barnabas um, connected with him. And that's because of his calling to go and minister to the Gentiles. And, and Saul, who will be later referred to as Paul, references this in his testimony in Acts 22. 
Some also believe that Saul may have found that the church in Salatia, or may have founded the church in Salatia during this time. The bottom line is we don't know for sure exactly what happened during those uh, 10 years, but we do know that Saul is a chosen vessel to go to the Gentiles. And during these 10 years, God certainly was working and continuing to prepare him for such a time as this. We also can assume during Saul's time in Tarsus that it wasn't um, some sabbatical or some retreat to be refreshed and rested while waiting to be called upon. Saul got saved. He spent some time in the desert um, learning. And obviously before this, even though he was an unbeliever, he was trained as a Pharisee. He was certainly well-versed in Old Testament scripture, knew it very well, probably had much of it memorized. But then he's continued to spend time being ministered to by the Lord Jesus. And what does he do? He boldly starts proclaiming the gospel in Damascus. Then he heads to Jerusalem and does the same thing. His life is threatened. He moves, goes back to Tarsus. We don't assume he went to Tarsus to just, you know, lay low for a while. He probably began to continue to develop his gospel presentation and ministry and was trying to reach his, his fellow um, man in Tarsus, his home, his home city, with the gospel. And so he continued to do it there without a doubt. I'm sure of this. Um, and, and also, it was probably a time where God was teaching him to wait and to trust him. Um, you know, another thing is when you read accounts like this, or you read, um, even if you read accounts about missionaries who, who, when you can read their biography, and you can kind of see their life and how it goes, we skip over tons of time and we don't realize that in their lives many times there's these lulls there's these you know years where they're just going day by day waiting on the lord just being faithful and they don't see any fruit or they don't see any progress or they seems like every step forward is you know it's two or three steps backwards we don't always see all that because we can gloss right over it and we see the outcome in the end and the great testimony at the end but we don't see all the struggles the late nights the nights where they're you know, in bed, just crying out to the Lord because they have no idea where the next meal is going to come from. And so certainly during this time of Saul's life, God is developing his character, um, building him up and preparing him for his ministry, which was going to be one of difficulty. And the Lord even told him that. <clears throat> and so if we turn... To Philippians chapter 3 for a moment. Philippians chapter 3, and we look at verse 8. Paul writes this. He says, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that, in order that I may gain Christ. And so no doubt, during this time in Saul's life, he probably experienced a great loss. Rejection. Um, people not wanting to be around him. Some of the things... Um, additionally, if we turn over to Second Corinthians chapter, um, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, some of the things Paul describes in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, starting at verse twenty-three, are descriptions of things that possibly took place during his time in Tarsus. We know where some of these things took place, but not all of them, and so in Starting at verse 23 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, excuse me, um, Paul writes, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, 
Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And so obviously, Paul went through many challenges, and not the least, many of those challenges were taking place even when he was in um, Tarsus, and during those, those 10 years that the Lord had him there. And so what is God preparing? You know, this is what God was preparing Saul for. But the question we might ask ourselves this morning is what is God preparing us for? You know, are you yielding to him? Are you, are you active in what you are doing now? And are you praying about what God is preparing you for? I say this with no disrespect, but regardless of what your age is, regardless of what your status is, whether you're working or retired, regardless of your, even your physical condition, what are you doing to serve the Lord? You know, not everything is going to be doing what Barnabas did, where he's traveling and traveling and traveling. And he's, um, but, but yeah, at the same time, as we spoke about last week, we can be encouraging one another. We can pick up pen and paper. We can pick up the telephone. And we can encourage one another. We can encourage our brothers and sisters. Maybe you even have a desire for a Bible study, but you don't believe that God has necessarily, or you don't feel that you're right or equipped to run it. But are you sharing that with brothers and sisters so we can be praying about it? Maybe you aren't the one to lead it. Maybe you're the one to host it. Maybe you're the one to just attend it and encourage those who are part of it. And so what is what is God preparing you for? Even and, and again, I say this with no disrespect, but regardless of where you are in life, there's still things, you're still here, you're still breathing, God still has you here. And so what future things is he preparing you for as well and, and ways of service to him? It isn't about serving for recognition. It isn't about serving um, to obtain or for a security of salvation. We know that we do nothing. We add nothing to our salvation. We're serving because we belong to the king for the believer we belong to the king of kings and so the challenge would be what is god preparing you for what barnabas did for saul um, it needs to be practiced in our churches today mature believers need to enlist others and encourage them in their service for the lord you know it said about dl moody he had a policy and that new believers were to be given a task soon after uh, they were converted. And of course, being new and, and young, they were given things like handing out hymnals or passing out bulletins or greeting people. They weren't, obviously, weren't taking a novice and putting them into a teaching position or something like that. But they were saved to serve. They were put into a place to serve. And, and as a result, you know, some may be turned off and walk away from them. But I would say most people are going to mature more. They're going to grow. They're going to learn how to serve others rather than serve themselves. And ultimately, in the process, God's going to work in their hearts about who it is that they are serving. It's not about serving so we can feel good about ourselves, though it does feel good um, when we do it, especially when we do it for the Lord and for the right reasons. And he can minister to us and humble us in that service. And so I think it's a good policy and one that will help grow and mature believers in their walk with the Lord. Boy, where's the printer work today? This thing is hard to move. <clears throat> and so the work, the work, work begins. And so they, so he went to Tarsus. He gets Paul, and as back in verse twenty-six, as it says, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people and so the work begins it was no small task twice it is stated um, in this chapter from verse 21 to 24 
that a great number or a great many people were added to the Lord. And so there's a great ministry in Antioch. These two men made up a powerful ministry, a powerful ministry team to the large number of new Gentile believers in Antioch. And unlike many of the Jewish believers, they would have had a background, um, a working knowledge, we could say, of the commandments of God in the Old Testament. But the, but the Gentiles had little to none. Um, they only had a pagan background for the most part. And so there was much work to be done there with the Gentile believers in Antioch. This wasn't some five-hour crash course or weekend conference. It was a, a full plate of well-organized preaching and teaching and shepherding these precious saints. And remember, these saints were, were still residing in a hostile pagan environment. Antioch was as pagan as you could get. Uh, it was next to Corinth. As, as far as debauchery, as some historians have stated. These two men knew what was important and necessary for the new believers. It was teaching them the word of God. Today, sadly, in many churches, this is so far down the list that sometimes it falls right off. You know, the CEO church growth business model is not interested in, in reading the Bible because it's not popular. It's not, um, it's not fun. It's not, I don't know, it's not flashy and fast. And, and that's a grave mistake. It is. It's wonderful. It's powerful. It's the word of God. And we're, not, we're not told in scripture that we need to come up with new and improved ways of communicating God's love through our own efforts and through our own interpretations. Um, we're told that the saints gathered together in the New Testament and they read the scriptures. We're told that back in Acts chapter 6, you remember Peter's concern was that they needed seven men to be picked to handle a lot of the ministry, um, or really a lot of the other work that, that coincided with the ministry so that they could focus on prayer and ministering God's Word. I don't know why we would take that and throw that away and say that's, you know, that's not really important now. It's of utmost importance. Saul and Barnabas and their example of ministry is an important one for the church today. Now, MacArthur wrote, teaching the word of God is at the heart of the church's ministry. Teaching the word of God is at the heart of the church's ministry. Do you remember well, actually, we already went over that, but, and so we know this from the apostles. We know this from the word of God, from what we've seen. And so this is of utmost importance for Paul or Saul and Barnabas at this time. <clears throat> we know that Barnabas and Saul did their work well. Antioch was a very pagan and lost city that became intimately involved in the Great Commission. They got saved, and eventually Antioch became a hub or a center place uh, for laborers sending out mission, missionaries to the mission field in the surrounding areas. The foundational work Saul and Barnabas did there was crucial, and to God be the glory, it was blessed and successful. And so the disciples, um, or they discipled there, they did well. And then it's here that we're told that the disciples are first called Christians. The I-A-N suffix um, at the end of Christian there, or the ending, is the, is, um, it's the word um, that simply, basically it means belonging to the party of. Okay, so in this case, Christians is belonging to the party of Christ or of Jesus. And so it was a... It, it recognized you when you had that title as belonging to Christ. The significance of the name emphasized by the word order in the Greek text is that people recognize Christians as a distinct group. Um, the church was being more and more identified as a distinct group and being more and more separated from Judaism, where it was very much grounded um, because all the first believers there at Pentecost were primarily Jewish men, um, if really not exclusive. And we also know that many events unfolded so that we know that God was sending them out um, to, to the Samaritans. And so once they got past that, they realized, okay, 
Samaritans are part of this as well. Remember, the Samaritans have a Jewish connection. Uh, you could say they're, they're half-breeds is sometimes the way they were referred to. Of course, they the Jews and the Samaritans had a bad, sour relationship, and yet maybe they could accept it still because of the connection there. But the Gentiles was a whole other matter. And so we spent time going through that, how Peter was sent, how the vision came three times to him, how the, the account um, of those visions that he and Cornelius had was repeated three times to emphasize the importance and that God is no respecter of persons and that he was saving Gentiles as Gentiles, not as proselytes or converts to Judaism. And so what's happening now is that the, the Christian church is becoming more and more distinct as followers of Christ and not so much grounded in all the Old Testament works and things um, that were still important, but remember the dietary restrictions were gone. Um, circumcision will be dealt with later. Um, other areas and aspects of this was you didn't have to become Jewish to become a Christian because that's like adding works to your salvation in, in, in a way, um, depending on how you're viewing it. But ultimately what's going on is that this group, this Christian group, these followers or these men and women that belong to the party of Christ are being more and more distinct as their own group. There was never meant to be two bodies of Christ or two churches in the body of Christ. Therefore, Christians belonging to the party of Jesus Christ is a very appropriate name. Now, although it was initially um, a term of derision, ridicule, or mockery, <clears throat> became a badge of honor, is what it ultimately became. Um, they were first given this term, again, associating them with Christ uh, as a form of mocking them, of identifying them the way that they did so that they could kind of pick them out of a crowd. And it was meant for mockery and ridicule, but many wore it as a badge of honor. And there is a historian, Eusebius, uh, excuse me, Eusebius, who gives an account of a martyr named uh, Sanctus, who replied to his torturer's questions, I am a Christian, over and over again. I am a Christian as they tortured him. And there are only two other places, actually, in the New Testament where, where the word Christian actually shows up, Acts 26 and 28, or verse 28, excuse me, and then again, also in 1 Peter 4.16. Now, 1 Peter 4.16 says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name as a Christian. The early church suffered for the name of Jesus. They suffered because people understood what it, was, what it meant. And when someone claimed to be a Christian, to belong to the party of Jesus Christ, um, it wasn't this... It wasn't this idea of, you know, this is this is my thing, um, but if it's not for you, you know, you do you, I'll do me. It wasn't, okay, you know, we're all just kind of heading up a path of the mountain, just different ways. That wasn't what it was. It was an exclusive offering that Christ and through Christ alone was the only way of salvation. And, of course, it insults people because you're trying to say, well, you're saying my culture, my beliefs, my um, traditions are not good enough and you're, we have to be just like you. No, don't be like us. Be like Christ. Um, he, is, he is the only way. He's, Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by um, the Son, by Jesus. And so <clears throat> the early church suffered a lot. They weren't inclusive enough. They were rejecting many of the traditions. And remember, names and traditions and, and um, cultural things were very important. They still are very important in many parts of the world. I think it's something that gets lost a little bit more here for us in the West. But there's many areas where, um, you know, my sister I mentioned was um, did a short-term, like, two-year missionary journey in Bulgaria. And many of them are of a Muslim background but they don't really practice. They don't really know anything about Islam other than it's very much their identity. And that's what they hold on to it for. Well, it's my identity. It's who I am. Um, though they don't practice it, they don't keep it. They don't even, my sister probably knew more about it than they did. 
but not all of them, but many of the young people, but it was their identity. And so they held on to it dearly. And so no doubt some of this was still an issue back then. And so it was in itself. People, you know, it, it, it basically following Christ, it's going to minimize the works of men because they're not going to get you saved in any way, shape or form. I forget who said it, but I know someone once said, you know, the only thing I contribute to my salvation is my sin. And that's the only thing any of us contribute to it. And yet, it, it belittles men, it lessens men, but it, it, it exemplifies, it um, amplifies, it um, increases who God is and the importance of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, <clears throat> you know, being a Christian represents the fact that we are all sinners. Um, turning away from sin and toward Christ is by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. You know, as Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that, that offends people today. It offended people back then. And so having and bearing the name of Christian has been we haven't experienced it here in the West. Yeah, maybe someone's made fun of us. Maybe we've seen jokes online and other things like that. But ultimately, we have not faced the persecution that many brothers and sisters around the world have faced in the past and still do today. Uh, none the least, the folks in Antioch certainly did face it. But there's a question that was posed by Dr. David Otis Fuller. It's one I'd like for us to close with this morning. And he says, he asks a very crucial question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I'll read it again. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Yes, many people. I forget the latest numbers, but at some point it was something in the 80s, maybe it's in the high 70s, of people in the United States profess to be Christian. But would we see any real evidence of it, um, biblical evidence for it? But I wonder if we could ask the same question of ourselves. You know, do our neighbors know that we're Christians? Do our coworkers know that we're Christians? And I don't mean just in name, because many, many people will be like, well, I don't I'm a Christian too. It's one of the things when I was a young, after I, I'd made a profession of faith when I was quite young. And I remember I asked all my friends and, and I'd asked a lot of people if they were a Christian and they would almost always say yes. And I was just like, oh, great. And I'd be like, mom, this guy said he's a Christian. This person said they're a Christian. And, and I found out later on, well, she's like, well, she spoke to me about it and told me the fact that it's like, yes, a lot of people will say they are. Um, but, you know, but do they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And I was like, well, I didn't really quite completely understand that. I just assumed that meant if you said the name Christian, you must mean that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he died for your sins, and that you are a sinner and there's no other way to God and to heaven apart from Christ. And so the same thing today, many people will say that they are believers, but we want to make sure we are presenting the gospel. And then for us who are believers, we want to ask that question. Is there enough evidence? If it was outlawed today, would they come knocking on us, our doors because they knew we were followers of Christ? Um, it's a very important question. It's one of utmost importance. Um, and the answer to that question is a matter of life and death. And so, <clears throat> oops, we just switch this. So just as in closing, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Romans 3.10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And then verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is holy. We spoke about that last, I think it was last week a little bit. He's holy. He's perfect. He's separate. Um, all of creation 
is, is separate from his holiness because he is so perfectly holy. We can't, um, often we, we fail to even emphasize who God is when we give the gospel. We don't serve a man-made God. We don't serve a God who is in our likeness or we can fit into a box or into our little minds. We serve a perfectly holy and just God. And so he is holy. And none of us are holy. All of us are sinners. Um, whether you recognize it or not, you are. Because we're told very clearly in Scripture, for as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And for what we earn for our sin is death, for the wages of sin. We just read this, but we'll read it again. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us and, why, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is an important thing because we have all met people, and maybe you're one of those people today that's trying to get things organized, trying to get your life in order, and then you will uh, come back to church or you'll, or you'll get to know the Lord or you'll start reading the, the Bible again. You're not going to be able to clean yourself up. You're not going to be able to do enough things uh, and I'm not sure what the goal is in accomplishing that exactly, but if it's a if it's an effort to earn your way, to be able to contribute to having a good standing before the Lord, well, it's 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 in vain. You will not. And so we thank God, we praise the Lord that while we were all sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up and then gave Himself. He did it before. Not one of us deserved it. Not one of us. But John 3, 16, a well-known verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's Jesus. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Who is your faith in? Is it in yourself, in your works, in something else? Is it in another Jesus or another God? Or is it in the Jesus of Scripture? Hebrews 3, 3, 15, as it is, as it's, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. We say this a lot, but there are so many people that have this idea that I will do it later. I will deal with it later. Let me think about it longer. I can deal with that when I get older. I'm young. I have my full life ahead of me. You don't know how long you have. You don't even know if you'll make it home from wherever you are today. And so do not wait. If God has, you know, if you tugged on the heartstrings of your heart, cry out to him. Cry out to Christ today. Do not put it off. You have no idea how long you have to live. I've, I've mentioned this many times, but I'll say it again. <clears throat> I had a dear cousin just coming out of high school, was given the gospel, said I can worry about that later lived about two more years, and was killed in a motorcycle accident. Never had a chance. I shouldn't say that. He had plenty of chances. But he never got that long life that he thought he would have to figure these things out later. Don't put it off. There is no such thing as purgatory. There is no second chances. This is the time. This is the day. Um, you will either bow willingly today to the Lord, or you will bow to him um, in the future. But Unfortunately, you will be cast out. You'll be departed. For you did not, he does not know you. And so know him today. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John 3.36. <clears throat> there is still wrath to come. It is not for the believer. It's for the unbeliever. We've talked about this before, but I'll say it again because we never know who may be joining us online. Wrath, the wrathful God is so often attributed to that's Old Testament God, and we have some new New Testament God. No, we don't. He's immutable, he's unchanging, he is the same God. He is merciful, he is long suffering, but he is just. And the wrath of God is still to come. And for the believer, it won't come because Christ took upon himself. Our sins and the full weight of God's wrath that was owed to me, owed to all other believers upon himself. He imputed his righteousness to us. 
And so I am so grateful for that. It's incredible. It's really amazing. You cannot grow tired of hearing this. Uh, we can't even exhaust the information that we have regarding the salvation that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is deep. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Again, today is the day. Friend, don't put it off. We'll finish with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, two of my favorite verses. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you're going to boast in anything, boast in Christ, in Christ alone. There's nothing we can add or do to earn salvation, to keep salvation, or to secure our salvation. It is all in Christ, in Christ alone. If you have questions about this, or encourage you please contact us um, give us a call send us an email come and visit us um, somebody here myself especially would be more than happy to speak with you about this and so god bless